So what I want to encourage you is you don't have to be afraid. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and an awesome, and a gracious God. And I pray as always that this message is a message that you, God, have for your people. I pray that the proud amongst us will be humbled, but that the humble will be lifted up. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. I would like you to open up your Bibles to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 22, 21 to 35. We don't have time tonight to read the whole chapter, so I kind of want to fill you in. The people of Israel have been delivered from their slavery and their bondage by the mighty hand of God. They've walked through the Red Sea, they've received the commandments, and they're now traveling. There's a large 400,000 Israelite horde wandering, not wandering, excuse me, they're on mission. And where we pick up the story, they have just completely eradicated the Amorites. They asked for permission to walk through their property. They did not give it. The Amorites started a war, and the Amorites got annihilated by Israel. Now, the neighbors of the Amorites were this people called the Moabites. And the king of Moab, his name was Balak. And Balak saw the Israelite horde and was terrified. So Balak, the king, sent emissaries, they were a stu- superstitious people, to Balaam. Balaam was a prophet for hire. Baal was the god of that land. And if you would pay Balaam enough, Balaam would prophesy against who you wanted him to prophesy against. And the thought was they would be cursed because Balaam spoke it. So Balak, the king of Moab, afraid of the Israelites, sent emissaries to Balaam to prophesy against Israel. Balaam takes a night and God speaks to Balaam and says, do not curse this people. They are my people. They cannot be cursed. So Balaam at first refuses. So Balak, the king of Moab, sends better dignitaries with more money. Now, if you read just the Old Testament, it's kind of difficult to discern how Balaam makes a mistake because Balaam goes with them only after God said go. But the New Testament tells us that Balaam, in his heart, was going to do exactly what Balak wanted him to do, which is take the money curse Israel, even though God had told him that the people would not be cursed. Everybody with me on the story? Let's begin at verse 21. So Balaam mounts a donkey and is going to go with the Moabites to curse Israel. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey... And she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, by the way, (laughs) Balaam just 
start so I gotta tell you, if a, my donkey started talking to me, I'd have a moment of pause, wouldn't you? He does not. Balaam said to the donkey, because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. All right, I could have chosen uh, numerous accounts. I chose a pretty fantastical account in the Bible. This is one of the stories in the Bible that most critics, and to be honest with you, a lot of Christians find very hard to believe, that a donkey spoke. But now we believe in a God that rose from the dead, amen? Can he speak through a donkey, yes or no? He does it here every Sunday and Wednesday. Okay. So the, <laughs> all right. So, so the point here is he, if he, he can do whatever he wills. The reason I share this account is because God spoke to Balaam first. I told you that. And said, do not curse Israel. Balaam it's hard pressed to find it in the account, but in the New Testament it's made clear in 2 Peter chapter 2. Balaam knows the word of the Lord, but in his heart, he's not going to follow it. He's going to disobey. He's going to curse the people of Israel. Take the money, curse the people of Israel. That's what he's going to do. So the Lord opposes Balaam. All right. So that's the situation. And then God, after he spoke, God himself spoke to Balaam. So now he speaks to Balaam through a donkey. Through the most foolish, ridiculous, and simplistic of creatures. And through that word spoken, saves Balaam's life. God chose a stupid donkey to see the danger and correct the powerful prophet. So the powerful prophet corrected by the donkey. Very important first principle. The wise and powerful of any age often dismiss God's word. All right? That's what we're going to see. Do we not see that throughout history? That wise, quote-unquote wise people, quote-unquote powerful people, often dismiss the voice of God. Balaam was a prophet. Balak was the king of Moab. They knew the truth. They knew it. They knew God's word. They knew that the people of Israel were God's people. They knew that God had commanded that those people were his people, that they could not be cursed, not at this moment. So God had spoken it, but they were in power. And that word from God was a threat to them, a threat to their comfort, a threat to their power, a threat to their position. So they dismissed God's word and they said, we're going to do what we want to do. And then God corrects the situation through the mouth of a donkey. This is actually a very important principle. Why do you think it is, by the way? I know I put up there that the wise and the powerful, but it's regular folks too. It really is. What is the motivation for people? What's the motivation just in your own hearts? I think everybody in this room at some point in their life has compromised what they knew to be good, what they knew to be right, what they knew to be holy. And there was a reason behind your compromise. And you made a choice to do things your way. Why did you do it? I can tell you why I did it. Of course, it's pride, but pride in want in a particular fashion. Doing what God told me to do 
would cost me more than I wanted to pay. And I don't mean just money. A five-year-old child that steals a cookie from the cookie jar. And the mother says, did you steal a cookie from the cookie jar? And the five-year-old says, no, mommy, no. Why is the five-year-old saying, no, mommy, no? The five-year-old is making a prediction. If I tell mommy what I've done, I will get what? I don't want to be punished. Therefore, I want to remain comfortable. I want to remain safe. I want to remain the way that I am right now. Therefore, I will compromise what I know to be true in order to spare myself. So the motive, whenever we dismiss God's word, is always for the sake of my comfort. I want to stay in the position I'm in. I want to stay in the place that I'm in. I want to remain comfortable. And when you have a lot of power, what are you? You're comfortable. When you're wise in the age of this world, what are you? Comfortable. Think about history. Think about the biblical history. Pharisees and Sadducees. They had power. Why wouldn't they just... They never... Have you noticed... They never actually stopped and asked, is what this Jesus saying true? They always just thought about the implications. If Jesus is true, then what's the implication for my status, comfort, and life? Okay? So when people ask, when the powerful ask, why did Herod want to kill Jesus? Did he care about the Messiah? Did he care about Christ? Did he care about religious things? No. All he heard was there's a king born. Well, if a king is born, that is what? A threat to my comfort. Have you ever stopped? You know, sometimes I'll see memes on social media. And the memes will say, I don't understand why people... Uh, no one would be upset if somebody said they believed in Zeus. How come they get upset? Because they believe in Jesus. Make, that's a stupid meme. Don't share that kind of meme. You want to know why it's a stupid meme? I'm going to tell you why it's a stupid meme. Because Zeus is no threat to anyone. Jesus, on the other hand, they know precisely what they're doing. Jesus is a terrible threat. As a matter of fact, isn't it Jesus that said, if you want to follow me, what must you do? Deny yourself. Meaning, deny this world. Deny that your comfort comes first and follow me. Isn't that what Jesus said? So God made a decision. I'm going to save, I'm going to save the world through what the world would consider complete foolishness. 1 Corinthians. Oh, so, this is the other principle. People surrender what they know to be true in exchange for personal comfort or pleasure. That's what people do. So have you ever, let me just give you some very simple examples, okay? I want to be obvious, but I don't want to be cruel to any human being. We are debating in our culture whether men can get pregnant. No, no, that's the debate. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. It's a legitimate debate in our culture whether men can get pregnant. Senators on Capitol Hill. Now, of course, men, the way you and I might define men, can't be pregnant, meaning it's a woman that gets pregnant, but it's a woman who claims to be a man. All right. Because of the culture in which we live, we all hear that, it gets repeated enough, and we surrender what we know to be true in exchange to remain comfortable. Because if we just speak out loud the truth, if we just say what's true, all of a sudden, what happens? 
you are not just unpopular, but you lose your comfort. If you just say, no. No. The answer is no. And this happens in our culture all the time. Christians, because they are afraid, they want to remain comfortable. And so they say nothing. And then the culture takes one more step. Okay. And then guess what happens? One more step. Until you find yourself in a place you never thought imaginable. And here's the thing. We all do these kinds of things. How many compromises have you made in your life just to remain comfortable? You knew that it wasn't right. You knew that it wasn't good. Maybe what you do is you just retire early. Maybe that's what you do. You just retire early so I don't have to what? Deal with it. Maybe you get up and move. I'm just going to move. I'm just going to move so I don't have to what? Do you not understand that the reason you were placed there was to be the light of Christ in that place? But your decision was to what? I just want to be what? Comfortable. Soon there will be no place to retreat to. I just want you to know that. Soon there will be nowhere to go. Because every single Christian, in order to remain comfortable, backs away. And that's what happens. That is not what happened with God. Look at what God did. For the word of the, Lord, word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Our salvation is complete foolishness to those who don't believe. It's foolishness. Both to us who are being saved, but to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. So understand that your salvation is stupid to the world. That, by the way, I'm not trying to tell you to be hateful toward the world. I just want you to understand they already think what? You're dumb. That's what they already think. Okay, I'm not mad about that. Just understand it. It's foolishness. But to you and me, it is what? I mean, I've done this illustration before, but just think through what's happening tonight. Just think through what's happening tonight. Imagine if you knew nothing of God and you watched what was happening tonight. Just tonight, okay? Just imagine it. You come in, no idea. And then we sing a bunch of songs. Who are we singing to? Our imaginary sky daddy. This imaginary sky daddy we are singing songs to. Then you take your hard-earned money and you slam it in a box so that we can keep singing to the imaginary sky daddy. Then a 300-pound guy stands up and yells at you for like a half an hour. Then after I yell at you for half an hour about a book that was written 2,000 years ago telling you to believe in a guy that died on a Roman instrument of torture, then we take a little shot glass of wine and a little piece of bread. Bill takes gluten-free. Uh, but nevertheless, a little shot glass of wine and bread, and then you guys treat it so serious. like, oh, it's very, very serious. Then we sing to Imaginary Sky Daddy, and then we leave. To the world, what is that? That is so dumb. You've worked all day. You're tired. I'll bet you 95% of you question whether you should show up tonight. Okay? And then you're like, oh, I got to sing to Sky Daddy. I got to do it. All right, let's go. Okay. So the word of the cross is what? It's complete folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. You know the truth. We're singing to a living God who sent his son Jesus to die and then rise again. The reason we have instruments of torture here is because our salvation came through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not just a shot glass of wine and bread. It is the very body and blood of our Lord that offers us forgiveness of sins, a right standing with God, and we are going to heaven. So to us, it is the most important thing that we could possibly do. 
All right. Foolishness to them, the very power of God. Then what does God say? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. What does he basically say? All the powerful and the wise in this world, what am I going to do? Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? I wish we'd catch on to that. Has not God made fools of the wise in this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. If you won't listen when God speaks from heaven, he'll say it through the mouth of an ass. <laughs> That's really just that simple. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God, not that God is ever foolish. I think you get the verbal gymnastics Paul is doing here. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification. Jesus is our wisdom. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our holiness. Jesus is our redemption. So we are followers of Jesus, not of this world. So what I want to encourage you is you don't have to be afraid. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's the key verse. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Just as an example, look at how he saved us. If you were going to write the story that God became a man, where would he be born? If you were going to write the story, don't think of your Christian story. Think of the God of God, the King of Kings is born. Where would he be born? He'd be born in a palace. He'd be powerful. He'd be like Bill Gates' kid. Our Savior was born in a stall in a manger to poor people. The first witnesses to his birth were lowly shepherds. That's not how you do it. If your goal was to be wise in the eyes of this world. That is an artist's rendition of Jesus, of course. We don't know exactly what he looked like. But the point is, he looks like a regular dude. According to Isaiah, there was nothing special about looking at Jesus. So it's not like he looked like Hulk Hogan or Graham. <laughs> he was a regular dude. Nothing special. Then the method of salvation, if you were to write the story, would the main character die a humiliating death, naked on a cross, beaten and whipped, and his flesh being ripped from his body? No. As a matter of fact, this was so not what people expected that Satan even helped the process of his own defeat. Do you understand how amazing that is? Satan filled Judas to betray Jesus... Satan wanted Jesus on the cross. Satan was so surprised at how God was going to save the world that he assisted in the process of his own defeat. What an amazing God. As soon as Jesus closed his eyes, I wish I could see Satan's face. Like, what? Watch this. Oh my. The sins of the world are paid for. He just released all those who I had in bondage. He just redeemed the world. And I, what? Helped him. What an amazing story. The foolishness of God is stronger, what? And then he rose from the dead, defeating our final enemy. And what about now? Communion and baptism. You know, sometimes I'll say, Take your sins to the cross. You can't go there. The cross was 2,000 years ago. So what God did 
was through simple elements, bread, wine, water. What are those elements? Who, who has access to those elements? Bread, wine, water. Through these elements, he says, I'm going to bring the cross where? To you. You need to redefine why you're here so that you get a good idea. You're not here primarily to praise God. You are here primarily to receive from Him. You come here to receive His gifts. That's primary. His body, His blood, the water, the Word. You come here to receive from Him. You respond in praise. Church is God's gift to you. You come here to meet with God. The foolishness of God, it's foolish. The most powerful thing in the world is a shot glass of wine and a little strip mine piece of bread. How is this the most powerful thing? How is this more powerful than a politician, than a kingdom? Because the Christ comes to you and forgives you and makes you his son and daughter. What an amazing thing. So a simple principle. Whenever the world contradicts God, believe God. Isn't that simple? Whenever the world contradicts God, believe God. And not only believe him, proclaim the truth with gentleness and respect. Live it out. Do not live by a lie. It's never loving to live by a lie. The world wins when Christians stop talking. You know, I'm going to get on my one little soapbox here. Huh. Okay, maybe my like 15th. I believe that our system of government was brilliant, brilliantly written. And the First Amendment, uh, this is how this is happening in this world. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I want you to pay attention. Lots of politicians will say that we have the freedom to worship. When does worship take place? In this building. The First Amendment does not guarantee you the freedom of worship. It's there, but... Government cannot make a law that prohibits you from exercising your religion. Where can you exercise your religion? Everywhere. There is no law written that can stop you from loving Jesus and talking about him. It doesn't exist. Not here. So we need to stop being what? We need to stop being afraid. I didn't say be a jerk. That doesn't work. But to confidently, lovingly, honestly, and boldly live out the truth. And you'll see, people are attracted to the truth. How many times have you been in a situation where nobody speaks up, and you do, and then afterwards, like 10 people come up and you go, yeah, I kind of thought the same thing. Maybe you're one of those 10 people that went up to the one person who spoke up and said, you know, I kind of thought the same thing. You know what I mean? Just be that person. Be that person. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. We glorify you. You are our God. You are our King. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ. Be the men and women of God that you call us to be. It's in your precious and holy name we pray this. Amen.